Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. On the show tonight... We've got to be bold and transformative. Four city council members shared their thoughts on the mayor's budget proposal, the embattled park district, and more. Fair, equitable, and inclusive. Illinois lawmakers' decisions could have a big impact on the future of politics in Washington. We have been working for a long time and it's beginning to come to fruition. What a $20 million neighborhood investment could mean for South Chicago res residents. It all sounds very Hollywood. NASA takes aim at a relatively close asteroid in a test of its planetary defense capabilities. Vandersloot, the pull up is good and Chicago has its first lead. Chicago Sky players are heading into their second game of the WNBA Finals, shooting for their first ever championship. The reasons why you love baseball and why you love White Sox baseball. And one last look at the White Sox before we bid goodbye to the 2021 season. Three murals created by Chicago artists bring the team's history of diversity to brilliant life. But first, some of today's top stories. As we mentioned, the Chicago White Sox's playoff road comes to an end. Soxie. Bouncing ball to the right side. Altuve's got it. The throw to first for a fifth consecutive season. The Houston Astros are headed to the American League Championship Series. After staying alive in a wild game three and after storms so yesterday forced a delay, the Sox fall in a 10 to 1 thumping to the Houston Astros. This year marked the first time in franchise history the Sox made back to back playoff appearances. The Astros now move on to face the Boston Red Sox. First Lady Jill Biden begins a two-day visit in Chicago to mark Hispanic Heritage Month. It's Biden's first time in Chicago in her current role. She arrived at Midway Airport this afternoon and toured the National Museum of Mexican Art in Pilsen. Biden was joined by local politicians, including Governor J.B. Pritzker, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle, Senator Tammy Duckworth, and Congressman Jesus Chuy Garcia, who is hosting her visit. She's scheduled to visit the Arturo Velasquez Institute at Richard J. Daley College tomorrow. Former Chicago Police Union President Dean Angelo has died this after being hospitalized with COVID-19 complications. The Fraternal Order of Police Chicago Lodge 7 announced Angelo's death this afternoon. Late last month, his son, a CPD sergeant, confirmed his father had been admitted to the ICU but declined to disclose whether Angelo had been vaccinated. Angelo served as the local FOP president from 2014 to 2017 before losing a re-election bid to then pre president that came before John Catanzaro. The former home of blues legend Muddy Waters is one step closer to landmark status. A city council committee voted unanimously today to recommend the North Kenwood 2 flat be designated as a Chicago landmark. The effort was spearheaded by the musician's granddaughter, Chandra Cooper, who is working to transform the house into the Mojo Museum to celebrate the legacy of Waters and other pioneering blues musicians. The landmarking effort is set for a final vote on Thursday. And up next, members of City Council on Chicago's persistent violence problem. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. Upheaval at the Chicago Park District in the wake of a major sexual abuse scandal. This says Chicago's homicide numbers show no signs of abating. And City Council is in the midst of debating the mayor's $16 billion pandemic budget that has billions in federal aid and a couple hundred million more for the Chicago Police Department. Here to talk about all that and other topics are four members of City Council. They are Gilbert Viegas, who represents the 36th Ward and chairs the Committee on Economic, Capital and Technology Development. Pat Dowell from the 3rd Ward and chairs the Budget and Government Operations Committee. 
Chris Taliaferro from the 29th Ward and Chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Michelle Smith from the 43rd Ward who chairs the Committee on Ethics and Government Oversight. Welcome all of you back to Chicago tonight. Um, Alderwoman Smith, I want to start with this uh, Mike Kelly news. He is resigned from the Park District in the wake of this sexual abuse scandal of lifeguards. Are those all the changes that are necessary over there or should the board president, Avis Lavelle, also step down given what's happened? Well, I think that the that Mike Kelly's resignation is a good first step but we're a long way from resolving all of this we have to hear from all the victims and we have to really get to the root of what happened here uh, you, I, I believe that more resignations are in order uh, and it does likely include uh, the chairman of the board I think uh, uh, really it's possible the entire new board has to come in to really clean house uh, in the park district uh, Alderman Dow, do you agree? Should the mayor fire essentially the entire Park District board and clean house there? No, I don't think the entire board needs to be fired. In fact, we just approved, I believe, two new board members um, last sure. month, uh, unaffiliated with uh, the scandal that's occurred at the Park District. So I believe that both board members and perhaps others that are remaining on the board uh, should be able to stay and work with the new director coming in to clean up uh, the mess of the park district. All right, I want to turn over to, to crime. Alderman Talia Faro, there was a shootout in your ward a couple of weeks ago that got the mayor's ire because state's attorney Kim Fox declined to bring any charges, even though people were killed. There was gunfire going on uh, for a long time. Uh, the two of them met. Are the, is there any progress in that case? Well, I don't know whether there's any progress in the case and, and you know, what um, transpired as a result of their meeting. Um, but I think uh, across the entire city, not just in my ward, uh, we want to start seeing action being taken against those that are out there just committing harm and, and, and in fact, killing um, our residents. You know, well, in, in that case, the state's attorney said she just didn't have enough to bring charges and the chief of detectives agreed, even though there was gunfire, there was murder, they still couldn't bring charges. Uh, do you agree with that? Well, I, I somewhat disagree with the Paris. Um, here's, here's my thinking, and I'll say this very briefly. Um, we had uh, some gentlemen that had AK-47s in their car. Um, they were also arrested with firearms. Uh, that's a felony charge. Uh, we also had possession of stolen motor vehicles. That's a felony charge. We need to get them off the streets. If we can't get them with murder or, or felony murder, and I know that's controversial right now, um, we need to look at the other felonies that they did commit because they were released without charges. In other words, they were right back on the street the same day. Back in the community. Um, so, so you're saying there could have been some gun charges possibly brought there. Uh, Alderman Viegas, do you agree with the mayor that this is a problem of lax prosecution or is this a problem uh, from the top of the Chicago Police Department just not having effective crime fighting strategies? Well, I think, you know, there's two cases that occurred uh, in my ward. One was Serenity, who was a seven-year-old African-American young girl that was killed. The police uh, arrested uh, the uh, proposed perpetrator and was released because the state's attorney's office said that there wasn't enough information, although the, the, the chief of detectives thought there was sufficient information. And then the second case was a uh, National Guardsman, 19 years old, who was killed on, on, on home from, from leave. And think about that, the irony that he's preparing to go to war but dies here in a war that's going on in Chicago. There's a problem. There's a problem here. And the reality is, is that we have been too lax, and I say we, uh, the elected officials, whether it be at the state's attorney's office, uh, just everywhere have been lax on crime. People need to wake up. There is a problem here. We have five times the, 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 the murders uh, and, and shootouts in New York, three times more than LA. There's a problem here. Yeah, tra and so, tra um, tragic cases, obviously, and, and yes, Chicago's uh, homicide rate is far higher than New York and LA and has been for many years. Chicago Police Superintendent David Brown talked about the attrition rate uh, in the police department. Take a look. We believe uh, that uh, we'll be able to fill the vacancies. The impacts of what vacancies we, we do have on public safety uh, we don't take lightly as, at, at, at all. Alderwoman Smith, is this part of the problem here that uh, fewer people want to be police officers right now and the CPD is having a hard time recruiting new officers? Well, I, I really can't speak to what individual people's motivation is. What I can say is that 
we are not doing a good enough job prosecuting gun crimes. And even though and you're a former thousands federal thousands prosecutor, I mean, just for context yes. there. Yes. And so this is what I can say. You know, we know that we have among the strictest gun laws in the nation. And yet we're surrounded by places that have very lax gun laws. And while we really need the leadership of our federal partners to help us work on that problem, in the meantime, I strongly believe that if we are as anti-gun as we say, it should extend through the entire life of that gun, including the person who picks it up and uses it. If we don't want people to use guns, we have to be more aggressive and have stronger penalties. Are you saying it from the federal, from the fe from federal prosecutors or the state's attorney? The state's prosecution. The state's Our prosecution. Illinois laws need to be stricter on gun violence. That's something that we, is within our power to handle. Stricter laws on gun possession and using guns in violence and stricter prosecution. We oh. don't have to wait on help from Washington to so do you're those you're things. You're saying getting, things getting we can do state now. lawmakers and the governor to, to, to enact stricter laws in that regard. Alderwoman Dow, it's, it's not just homicides, but carjackings are way up. As we mentioned, Superintendent Brown testified before city council last week. Are you hearing any new strategies to combat these things? I, I didn't hear any new strategies from uh, the superintendent when he spoke before us. I mean, I, I think one of the things that came up during the uh, uh, budget hearings this uh, last two weeks was the call for some kind of uh, public safety gun violence summit to try to figure out who is really responsible here to uh, handle and tamp down on the crime that's going on in our city. Um, you know, finger pointing is not, never going to work. And we need to really think through, you know, what the courts can do, what the police can do, what the secretary, excuse me, the, uh, the um, state's attorney can do. Um, all of these are critical um, pieces of the puzzle to end uh, the violence that we see in the carjackings that we see. We have this uh, federal task force or on, uh, on gun trafficking and we have a carjacking task force but we don't seem to be uh, putting a dent in our problem. And so uh, more needs to be done. All right, and mm -hmm. we have a lot more to talk about, uh, but we're going to have to leave it there for right now. We'll be joined again by our guests to talk about the retirement of Inspector General Joe Ferguson and much more. But for now, our thanks to City Council members Gilbert Viegas, Pat Dowell, Chris Taliaferro, and Michelle Smith. And now, Brandis, we toss it back to you. Paris, thank you. Illinois lawmakers are in the process of deciding what a new congressional district map will look like. And the shifts here could be drastic, given that the state is losing a seat in Congress. Amanda Venicky joins us now with more. Amanda, where are lawmakers in this process? Well, Brandis, there's actually a lot of map making going on, so let's get straight away that Illinois legislators, as in state representatives and senators, actually have a couple of responsibilities here. They've got to draw a new map for themselves and actually check. They have already done that, but it is also up to Illinois state legislators to draw new boundaries for Illinois seats in Congress. And that is what they are working on now, holding a series of public hearings, seeking input. According to Representative State Butler, though, it isn't going great. He says the wrong address was given for anybody who wanted to attend a hearing today in person in Joliet. Again, we're making it very difficult for the public to participate in these hearings if we're sending them down a dead end road. Um, and I, I would say, um, not shockingly, I'm the only member here. He says they went down a literal dead end road, by the way, at least the map with the original address. Now, that hearing lasting only 15 minutes, most of which was taken up by attendance and then a staff member giving a pro forma lesson on how the redistricting process works. Not a single person or group gave comment on what the new congressional map should look like. Now, it was a little bit better or different anyway in the Senate, which also held a hearing today and a few people testified, one of whom suggesting a path to creating 
two Latino congressional districts. Right now there is one, that's the fourth district represented currently by Congressman Jesus Chuy Garcia. Now another witness expressed frustration with how all of this works, period. The League of Women Voters, Abigail Nichols, says when the legislature drew that state map, they ignored the public's input. She says it seems like state legislators are following that same pattern when it comes to the congressional version. There is no transparency and no assurance that the public will be able to have meaningful input prior to votes approving the congressional district maps by the Illinois Assembly. Now, Republicans have little say over how any of this has gone or will go because they are in the super minority in the Illinois House and Senate. Also, Democrats, J.B. Pritzker, of course, controlling the governor's office. So the GOP says this is all a dog and pony show. To say uh, to the witnesses that are on this and the witnesses that have taken time <laughs> in the past, I apologize to them for um, the complete disdain that the majority party uh, uh, holds them in. It, it is absolutely shameful, the lack of transparency, the refusal to answer basic questions, the um, ignoring the input of witnesses. Uh, this is shocking. It's, I would frankly be embarrassed. So GOP State Senator Jason Plummer there repeatedly tried to get Democrats to pledge to make public a draft of the congressional map before the Illinois General Assembly votes on it. But the co-chair of the Senate Redistricting Committee, Senator L.G. Sims, he gave no such pledge, saying only this. I don't know who's drawing the map, but I will stipulate that the, the General Assembly will, have, will take up a map that uh, reflects the fairness, it reflects the equity and transparency, and it reflects, reflects this transparent process. I talked today to Valerie Leonard, who says that she's too fatigued to participate in this round of hearings, given she says that it seems like legislators' minds are already made up on what that congressional map will look like. But Leonard, well, she's otherwise occupied with other redistricting matters. She leads the group Illinois African Americans for Equitable Redistricting, which has filed a complaint with the U.S. Department of Justice, alleging that that state legislative district map already signed into law by Governor Pritzker infringes upon the voting rights of black voters in Illinois through retrogression and delusion. Somebody's got to be the adult in the room and say, look, you know, these are the laws. we got to follow the law and, you know, we got to do what's right. And she's hoping the DOJ will do that because she says Illinois legislator state map makes a mockery of the Federal Voting Rights Act and subverts the voting rights of minorities. This, even as she recognizes, black Democrats control some of the most influential offices in Illinois, including positions with direct oversight over redistricting. We have a progressive white governor how did we end up with this voter dilution? I think um, the problem is they're more concerned about their veto-proof majority, more concerned about politics, and that, I believe, takes priority to drawing majority Black districts. Now, that state legislative map also facing a couple of other legal challenges. Meanwhile, the state legislature, the General Assembly, is set to be back a week from today. So we may then get a glimpse of what that new congressional district boundaries may look like. With that, Brandis, back to you. Amanda, thank you. A long disinvested Chicago neighborhood is getting a financial boost. The $20 million investment is intended to advance work already started by community groups like building affordable housing and revamping an old YMCA building. The infusion comes on the heels of Mayor Lori Lightfoot's Invest Southwest initiative. Now that's a three-year program aimed at investing $750 million in developments across 10 neighborhoods, including South Chicago. Joining us now with more are Angela Herlock, Executive Director at Claritian Associates, who pitched the neighborhood projects to receive the funding, and Rob McGee, Senior Vice President and Community and Economic Development Market Manager at Fifth Third Bank, 
the company making the $20 million investment. And before we get started, we should note that Fifth Third Bank is a financial supporter of WTTW as well. Uh, Rob McGee and Angela Herlock, thanks to both of you for joining us. Um, so the slogan of the project is we're steel here. Steel, that's S-T-E-E-L, is in the metal. Uh, Angela, what's the story behind that? So it's uh, long known that South Chicago uh, was the place that steel mills, at one point in time, nine steel mills reigned in South Chicago. Most of downtown was built uh, by the steel that was created in South Chicago. And so although that industry has now left the area, we want people to know that there's still families, there's still generations of people who are still living here, wanting to thrive and wanting to prosper. And Rob McGee, why South Chicago? Well, I, I normally don't answer a question with a question, but why not? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, South Chicago is just the epitome of the typical Chicago neighborhood or community uh, that has experienced years and years of disinvestment. And as you look at how areas such as the South Loop, the West Loop, Bucktown, um, Ukrainian Village, and, and Wicker Park, and uh, other areas similar to that, have had this explosion of investment. Uh, there are so many pockets of this city that's just a tapestry of very unique communities that have been left uh, sort of in the, in the dust. And so we look at South Chicago as an area that we can make a major investment, transform uh, that neighborhood and, and, and change the trajectory of the question of why to wow, as we've done in other areas that I've just mentioned prior to this. So uh, there are nine projects that are going to be funded. Uh, those projects include the Salud Center, New Homes Project, Pilgrim Performing Arts Center, the Calumet River Gateway Garden, Via Guadalupe, Cafe Rudish, Sacred, Streetscape Improvements, OLG Soccer Arena, and Multipurpose Space. Um, Angela, what do you hope these projects uh, will do for the community? So we have this concept that we are creating a community of choice, not a last resort. And community of choices have some very vibrant things. They have resident-led plans, affordable housing, uh, thriving business corridors, recreational and outdoor space, um, and economic opportunity for their, for their residents. And so these projects represent that. They represent uh, years of planning through our community, through the residents of a community, of what they wanted to see, what they wanted uh, and needed to be a community of choice. Rob McGee, what is the timeline uh, for this investment and for these developments? It'll be over a three-year period. Uh, the $20 million will be broken up such that $2 million will be uh, allocated for philanthropy and up to another $18 million uh, will be allocated for investments such as startup capital or uh, small business development, uh, mortgage loans, community development loans, and other um, forms of, of investments around education and financial inclusion. And Angela, we know that you know some of these projects have been a long time in the making already. How has the community been involved in this process? So every step of the way. So there have been many, many community meetings and um, infusion of ideas in the community, plus uh, business from everything from the faith-based community, from residents, uh, from uh, nonprofit leadership and those types of things. But it's been going on for a long time that we've been having these conversations. I sometimes in the community laugh and say, I have pictures when I was pregnant, my son is 10. So of different meetings that we were attending, just really putting these projects together. And Angela, sticking with you for a second, how does this overlap with the city's Invest Southwest initiative? This is right in line with the city's investment. In fact, uh, Clarice Associates makes up half of the corridor manager um, component. And so we are very thrilled with how the mayor has seen fit to make sure that this investment is across the city, but definitely in South Chicago, so that we can spark and catalyze interest in the community. And these projects work right in line. The closest one is a block away from where our latest Invest Southwest RFP is. Okay. Um, and Rob, why invest in projects that have already begun? Well, it's a combination of investing in projects that have already begun because we need partners um, to as essentially help them get their projects across the finish line. So all of our investments won't go towards projects that are already already half baked or, or three quarters of the way baked. But we want to also have a mixture of new development. I mean, there's 700 acres of vacant land in South Chicago. And I know Angela and her team are working on different ways of 
filling in those spots with affordable housing, retail and commercial developments. And so we wanna be a partner with her as she goes along that journey to fill in some of those uh, acres of, of vacant land. And in the few seconds before we let the both of you go, Rob, you know, advice to other corporate private uh, businesses um, on community investment and getting involved as well. I, I think you, you, you take a chance. Um, you find a way to uh, hit your wagon, as they say, to great partners like Angela uh, and her team. Uh, she's been doing this for 17 plus years now. Uh, she made it a, a point to uh, move her family to the community and to see that, that she and others have made an investment um, that makes our job that much easier. Okay, best of luck to the South Chicago neighborhood. We look forward to seeing uh, these developments as they come along. Rob McGee and Angela Herlock, thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you. Brent. Up next, local artists bring the many colors of baseball to vibrant life for the Chicago White Sox. Stay with us. Spend Saturday evening with the Voices of Chicago. Latino Voices at 6 and Black Voices at 6.30. See you on Saturdays. Well, that playoff run ended sooner than Sox fans had hoped, but here's one last bit of good news about the White Sox to close out the season. The Ball Club's Game Changers series began five years ago as an effort to support underrepresented communities in baseball through events and online discussions. But this year, the team switched it up. They asked three Chicago artists to create murals inspired by the White Sox past and present that celebrate the color of America's pastime. One mural features a subject whose voice is very familiar to both Sox fans and WTTW viewers. Here's producer Erica Gunderson with the story. It's a reminder to people of the contributions of so many of these different groups to not only White Sox history, but to a lot of the people who are our fans. White Sox fans know the smoky rumble of Gene Honda's voice well, but in this striking mural by Chicago artist Murs, it's his face that's among the stars. All four of the people in the Asian American mural were part of the 2005 year, the World Series year. And I'm not sure people remember that, but there it is. It was very humbling. And it, it, it still makes me smile when I, when I, I see that. Murs' tribute is one of three murals the White Sox commissioned as part of their Game Changer series. The series throws a spotlight on the contributions of underrepresented communities. The murals were unveiled at Guaranteed Rate Field over the course of the 2021 season. We've got uh, Tadahito Aguchi up there. We have uh, Shingo Tagatsu and Mansu Lee, everybody's favorite bullpen catcher from the 2005 World Series team. And then, of course, the familiar voice and face for the White Sox, our PA announcer, Gene Honda. Diversity is part of the White Sox history, and we've seen so many wonderful players, leaders, who have broken the color barrier here. So we wanted to feature artists who were White Sox fans, who were representative of the underrepresented communities, and I think we hit a home run. Grant's lamp, right? Because there's three incredible artists here who have just completely hit it out of the park. In his mural of Tim Anderson, artist Edo applies his energetic style to a portrait of the fan favorite shortstop. You got the Chicago flag on the sleeve. Underneath that, you got like a running base. Down by the elbow, you got like a white sock. The baseball helmet above that, you have popcorn. Above that, you have the number seven. In the back, both his daughter's names, Paxton and Peyton, um, above that purple heart right there. Edo says he wasn't sure what the subject of his mural would be until he saw footage of Anderson at an outreach event. I saw this video of him talking to the youth, and I was like, boom, there it is. Him being of service to the youth, that's pretty much who I am. That's what we connected, and that's kind of how it came to be. And then seeing me, seeing Tim Anderson, this color, doing what we do, you know what I'm saying, going after what we love and with, with the next level, like, fire and passion behind it, you know, I think that's something that will rub off on the youth who see us. In the third mural, a dreamlike scene by Chicago artist Ascend, a larger-than-life Jose Abreu swings his mighty bat under the Cienfuegos streetlights of his childhood. I think what was important to me was to show the story from the beginning to where it's now. So showing Cuba, showing where he was born, that's actually, you know, a street, an interpretation of a street in Cienfuegos, where he's from. The Venezuela-born artist played baseball himself for years and says the sport has deeply embedded itself into Latino culture. As a Latino, uh, anyone who made the majors 
from our country. You know, you were a fan of that team. Um, in our case, it was Ozzy Ian, you know, 80s and 90s, and I was a Sox fan over there, you know. We immigrated to Chicago in 95. I was 13, and we moved to the south side and just continued my love for the Sox here. For us, it's something that we do as kids, and we take into adults. And, I mean, we share games with our family. We share, you know, it, it just... Baseball is, is more than just a game, and it's just part of our everyday life. I think the awareness that here are three ethnic groups, and you've embraced them throughout the years as a White Sox fan. They are a part of your memories and part of the reasons why you love baseball and why you love White Sox baseball. For Chicago Tonight, this is Erica Gunderson. Beautiful murals, beautiful stories. The White Sox plan to use the murals to raise money for local nonprofits that support the Game Changers mission and say they'll announce more details on that soon. And now, Brandis, we toss it back to you. Paris, thank you. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, should Chicago fight to keep the Bears in Soldier Field or have times changed enough to put fiscal priorities elsewhere? Four older people weigh in. It sounds like it's out of a movie. NASA takes aim at a relatively close asteroid in a test of the agency's planetary defense capabilities. And the Chicago Sky attempt to topple the Phoenix Mercury, shooting to win their first ever WNBA championship. We have a preview. But first, some more of today's top stories. Forty people were shot in Chicago over the holiday weekend, including four fatally. Chicago police today released shooting stats from Friday evening through Monday night. The violence included a mass shooting in Wicker Park and drive-bys in Little Village and Austin. It comes amid a major spike in violence in Chicago, with shootings and homicides outpacing a deadly 2020. Controversial gunshot detection company ShotSpider, ShotSpotter is suing digital news outlet Vice. ShotSpotter claims that an article, podcast, and tweets from Vice's motherboard news site incorrectly reported on court records and accused the company of illegal actions. It's suing for defamation and demanding $300 million in damages. Vice has not commented on the suit. Shotspotters come under fire before from activists and some Chicago older people who claim the surveillance technology is inaccurate and leads to police targeting communities of color. A report from the city watchdog earlier this year found Shotspotter alerts rarely lead to evidence of a gun crime. And the Chicago Fire Department still isn't tracking its response times despite a report nearly a decade ago flagging the problem. Now that's according to an updated analysis by Chicago's outgoing Inspector General Joe Ferguson. The updated report released today slammed CFD for failing to track how long it takes to respond to fire and EMS calls and for falling short of meeting national best practices. The OIG's office says the fire departments acknowledge the importance of tracking response times and will work with the University of Chicago's Urban Labs to improve its analysis. The former owner of a debt collection business pleads guilty on a corruption charge tied to former Cook County Circuit Court Clerk Dorothy Brown. Donald Doniger of Pennsylvania admitted to one count of corruptly giving something of value to reward a public official, saying in the agreement he helped pay for part of a Women's History Month event hosted by then Clerk Brown in hopes of favorable treatment. At the time, Doniger's collections company had a contract with Cook County. Brown has for years been dogged by suspicion of corruption with former, former deputies facing charges and the FBI seizing her cell phone. She has not, though, been charged with a crime. And now to Paris with more from city council members. Paris. Thanks, Brandis. Earlier in the program, we discussed Chicago's pervasive violence, and now we're joined again by older people Gilbert Viegas, Pat Dowell, Chris Taliaferro, and Michelle Smith. I want to pick up with some of our discussion on crime. Alderman Taliaferro, the shot spotter technology came up in hearings last week. It's been really controversial. The police department says that it is accurate in depicting gunshots being fired and then deploying police officers, but the inspector general is saying it's, it mostly fires blanks, uh, meaning false alarms. Should that contract, very expensive contract, be renewed? Well, I, I think we should have public discourse on whether or not it should be renewed. I know we are extended for another two years, um, but I look forward to um, on November 12th uh, hearing in the Public Safety Committee uh, that will talk about the details of MacArthur's report as well as the Inspector General's report um, and leave it up to the public and my colleagues uh, to determine whether you, or not. Do you think it's been effective? 
I, I think it is effective. I, I think, um, uh, you know, one of the things that the MacArthur report that I, I I'm not going to say it's false reporting, but look, if they're shooting on the, uh, uh, or at least if the shot spotter um, system or technology uh, detects a shot and there's no casing, that does not mean that the shots did not occur, um, nor is a police report required. So um, I, I think it would be good for us as a council to get to uh, or get a better understanding of what the police response is and, and, and whether or not reports are done because many of my colleagues don't understand or, or, or don't know the procedure and when it comes down to responding uh, shots fired. But, um, certainly disagreement on, on, on the effectiveness of shot spotter. And Alderman Villegas, another thing that was brought up was the controversial gang database, which the mayor in her campaign vowed to scrap and redo. We still haven't seen a new database or, or what that would look like. Have you seen anything that, that, that would uh, be a new database and getting rid of the old one? No, I have. I have uh, first, I heard of it uh, of a new uh, model was uh, at, the, at the public at the uh, CPD hearings, Chicago Police Department hearings, where they talked about a new program they're going to be rolling out. Um, but again, that, they're still going off the existing uh, using the same intel, intel and information. Um, so I think I think they need to hurry up and get this done. And uh, Alderwoman Dowell, what what should a new gang database look like? And the problem here is that. People are on here. They don't have civil rights to appeal. They, they don't understand, in some cases, why they're on here. Or maybe something happened 50 years ago, so it's not very accurate. What needs to change? Well, one thing I know that has changed, I read today that the uh, police board has been given the powers to uh, handle appeals that people may have with uh, the, the database. I understand that the name of the gang database has changed, but the fact is that there are people that are on that database that should not be there and they need to have an opportunity one to understand why they're there and two to appeal their placement on that day gang database so um you know i can't tell you what uh what should what it should include but i can tell you what it should not include and that is people who um, have no affiliation with uh, crime, who were placed there because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, false names, um, all of that needs to be looked at, and the police board is providing an opportunity for individuals to appeal. So, so some developments there, and, and, and the issue here is people, if they're on that database, they have trouble finding jobs, they even have trouble finding places to live in some cases. Uh, Older Woman Smith, it's the inspector general that kind of brought uh, these things up last mm -hmm. week. He is stepping down. Has the mayor slow walked the process to replace him? Because it doesn't look like there is a replacement at this point. He's stepping down next no, week or at the, the end of this week. Uh, no, in, uh, in uh, the, the ordinance calls for a, a selection committee to be picked. And city council picked two people at our last city council meeting, and the mayor picked her three, and the process is happening. So I think we're, we're sort of right on track. The law says that within two weeks of his departure, uh, a search committee has to be named to help in that selection. So you're saying that, so that, that, committee, committee, is, that committee is already named. So in the interim, yes. who's gonna, who is going to uh, take charge in that office? My understanding is the mayor is going to appoint an acting from someone who already is working inside the inspector general's office. Very similar to what is done in a lot of our in a lot of our commissions when someone leaves and there's an. Would acting. that be the deputy IG the, for police, Deborah Witzberg? She's she's sort of been the number two in there. Well, I don't know, but there are. You know, direct Joe Joe Ferguson has direct reports, and I suspect the mayor is going to select someone from among those direct reports. All right. Close. All right. On another subject, Alderman Viegas, I don't know whether you're a Bears fan or not, but it does look like uh, Arlington Heights, uh, the odds are in their favor to land uh, the Bears in a new stadium. Is there something city council should uh, consider in terms of giving away land or, or a favorable deal on land to entice the Bears to stay? Well, to answer your first question, absolutely I'm a Bears fan, <laughs> a lifelong Bears fan. Uh, and, and, and I take a look at the, the, the property that's located uh, along the lakefront in the seventh and tenth ward, as as some as an, an area, uh, unless there's something that's developing there, uh, as something that might be enticing, it's right along the lake, uh, it would really spur economic development uh, on the south side of the on the south side of the city. 
Uh, we definitely have to try to do something, but the reality is, is that we're not going to give away the farm just to keep the bears. Uh, this is the third largest market. Uh, if the bears uh, do move, then we'll have to see if uh, there's an appetite to get another another uh, sports franchise in here. But, but you know, the bears. Uh, there's been a lot of negotiations. I think that the, the bears, the bear leadership, called uh, the administration's bluff, uh, and this is where we're at right now. Alderwoman Dowell, is there some land in the third ward that would be good for? Uh, a bear stadium and to possibly uh, spur on economic development. I can't think of any place in the third ward where a new bear stadium could be built. Or should um, it anywhere on the south side or, or in vacant land? The city well, I mean, has. I think Alderman Viegas raises some good points. I mean, I'm sure there's some places on the far south side or even on the west side where a new stadium could be located. But the reality is that, you know, this is not like in the 80s when we were looking at uh, helping the bears out. Um, we have to be very thoughtful about the types of financial assistance, the city assistance that we can give. Um, you know, times have changed, um, money is tight, and we need to be uh, very thoughtful about how we do this. We should expect that the Bears should kick in something. Uh, the National Football League, which has made millions and millions of dollars, uh, should also be um, called upon to assist in this effort. So I think we're a long way from deciding uh, a location. Let's see if we can get the elements the, or the parameters of a deal uh, put on paper. Now, that'd be interesting to see uh, if there is a possible deal to be had. And as the mayor said, uh, let's see if the Bears can beat Green Bay, because this, of course, is Packers week. Uh, and our thanks to city council members Gilbert Viegas, Pat Dowell, Chris Taliaferro, and Michelle Smith. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paris. Thank you. And up next, NASA tests its planetary defense capabilities. So stay with us for more on that. Coverage of science and technology on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Joel M. Friedman, president of the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund. A space mission to deflect an asteroid. It's been the premise for more than one Hollywood movie, but next month, NASA launches its DART mission that aims to do this in real life. Joining us now to talk about that and other NASA stories making headlines is local astronomer, planetary scientist, and space enthusiast, Mark Hammergren. Uh, welcome back, Mark, and thanks for joining us. So, Thank you for having me, yeah. Absolutely. NASA's DART, now that stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. Sounds like a Hollywood movie mission, as we've mentioned, but uh, <laughs> explain what NASA intends to do here. So the DART mission will go to asteroid Didymos, which is a double asteroid system, and this, most of the spacecraft is going to just smack into one of the, to the, into the moon of the asteroid. So this asteroid actually has a moon going around it, and it's the, the spacecraft is going to smack into it and deflect that moon a little bit. And the, the goal is to figure out, well, what happens to that asteroid system? How, how much does it get deflected? Okay. So, you know, is the purpose here just to test that this can be done in the event that we actually need to change the course of an asteroid in the future? Well, you know, I, I don't think there's a just about it. This is a very important kind of test to be made. This is the first test of its kind. And if we ever need the capability to deflect an asteroid, then this is going to be an essential kind of test. But on top of that, this uh, kind of uh, energetic impact will give us information about the internal structure of uh, this asteroid and by extension, other asteroids. So there's a lot of science that will come out of this as well. Of course, very, a very important, you know, a very important experiment uh, that, that's happening. Well, I'm sure scientists will learn a lot. Um, so if this were to have, you know, a small impact on the asteroid's uh, orbit, could that be enough? Um, should an asteroid need, need to be redirected? Yeah, absolutely. The, the key factor here is the lead time. How much warning time do we have? And how much time do we have to act? Uh, can we knock this asteroid, even just alter its velocity by a fraction of a millimeter a second? Over time, that will build up. And all we have to do is just nudge it enough to miss the Earth. That's really all we have to do. So, yeah, absolutely, this is something we can do. And how far away is this asteroid that we're talking about? 
Well, it's a near-Earth asteroid, so it comes within about maybe, it has the potential to come within about 16 times the distance from the Earth to the Moon. So near in uh, astronomical terms is within several million miles. It doesn't pose a direct hazard right now. Okay, relative term, of course. Um, so sticking with asteroids, NASA is also set to launch its Lucy spacecraft um, to Jupiter's Trojan asteroids. Explain what makes this mission special. So this is the first mission going out to the Trojan asteroids. The Trojan asteroids are thousands of asteroids that are, these are small, icy and rocky bodies. In this case, they share Jupiter's orbit. They got stuck in these orbits during the very formation of the solar system four and a half billion years ago. And they've resided in kind of like this, this cold refrigerator. So they should have materials that date back around to the beginning of the solar system. Looking at them will give us some insight as to what these conditions were, what they were made of, and also what's the history since that period of time. So it's a, it's a look back to these, the, the fossil record of the solar system. Wow, okay. Um, and finally, planetary scientists are learning more information about the Jezero Crater. Now that is uh, the one that the per Perseverance mission is exploring on Mars. What have we learned about the past history of this crater? They've got some really cool uh, visuals on these scarps, these, uh, these buttes, uh, uh, rises of land that were carved out when there was a, a river delta flowing into the crater. We've thought for a long time that there was a lake in the crater a long time ago in the past. There was a river delta flowing into it. But uh, this uh, cross-sectional view of the terrain that the rover uh, has provided that, that you can't get from satellites overhead is really spectacular because it, uh, it lets us look at the layers of the rock, the stratigraphy. And that's just like laying out the pages of a book, uh, a history book uh, of the history of Mars. And they've seen boulders up on top that uh, indicate that there were fast flowing floods, flash floods, after the, the period of uh, lake sedimentation. And quickly before we let you go, Mark, does this show that NASA is in fact in the right place um, to look for signs of ancient life on Mars? Yeah, definitely. So it really nails uh, the, the case that this, there was a lake here, there was long period of sedimentation a great place to look for fossils or organic material, and then flowing water on top of that, rapidly flowing water. It's a great history of Mars right there. So much to learn on Mars right there. Mark Hammergren, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure, always. Up next, from outer space to the Chicago sky, but first, a look at the weather. There's still a Chicago professional team that is very much alive in the playoffs right now. That would be the Chicago Sky. Chicago's WNBA franchise is in the finals for the first time since 2014, battling the Phoenix Mercury for the WNBA championship. The Sky lead the best of five finals 1-0 and play game two in Phoenix tomorrow. And joining us with more on the finals matchup is James Kay, co-host of the podcast, The Skyhook. And James joins us from Phoenix, where he's covering the team for the Chicago Tribune. James Kay, thanks for being here with Chicago Tonight. Hey, thank you so much for having me. This is so exciting. Well, it's great to have you, and it's an exciting time for, for the Chicago Sky. I mean, the buzz, of course, is Candace Parker, Naperville Central alum, superstar, coming back to Chicago after 13 seasons in L.A. How is the team able to land her, and what has she meant to this team? You know, one of the biggest things that I think it's important to know when discussing the Chicago Sky is how James Wade, the head coach and general manager, has rebuilt this franchise by creating a new foundation and has stabilized it and created a culture where they could land a player like Candace Parker, who, you know, she's played her entire career, who, who had played her entire career with the Los Angeles Sparks. And they really, what he's been able to do in creating a culture where you can get a superstar after so many have asked out of the situation uh, to me that has been the biggest reason but you also look around the roster and courtney vandersloot is one of the greatest point guards in WNBA history ellie quigley 
um, since she went to the 2014 finals with that Chicago Sky team has become a three-time all-star. So they had all the pieces to get things going, but uh, James Wade being able to stabilize this team um, is one of the reasons why Candace Parker looked at the situation and thought she can win a WNBA championship. Right. You know, the last time the, the Sky were in the WNBA Finals was 2014. And in between that time, it was not a very attractive place for free agents. You mentioned the coach, James Wade. How was he able to come in and, and just change the foundation here? You know, James Wade is an incredibly smart coach. He, um, he was an assistant coach for the Minnesota Lynx under Cheryl Reeve, where he helped Sylvia Fowles become a defensive player of the year. And, you know, he's just an incredibly smart guy. And he actually coached Ali Quigley and Courtney, and Courtney Vandersloot overseas. So he had a familiarity with the roster already. And he just he, he put in his own system. This is a team that likes to play up-tempo basketball. That really works when you have a player like Courtney Vandersloot, who can make any pass, um, is so good at manipulating defenders in the pick and roll. And... Yeah, she's been, um, her and James Wade are just the perfect pair. And then when you add a person like Candace Parker, who, again, is such a fantastic secondary facilitator, um, the Sky have just really been able to come together and their styles all fit together. And even though they went 16-16 this season, they have really made the most out of it. Um, made it like They've really found a way to turn it up to a new level uh, in the postseason. Cer certainly turned it up in the postseason. They lead that series right now with Phoenix one game and nothing. It was a very convincing win the other night. So how do you assess their chances here in this best of five where they've stolen the home court advantage now and they're going to come home this weekend? I don't see how Phoenix is really going to be able to rebound in this series. When you look at how Chicago, like I said, they like to play up-tempo basketball. And Phoenix is one of those teams that likes to slow things down and try to get things going in the half court. So the Chicago Sky were first in the WNBA. They had the fastest rate in the league when it came to seconds per possession after defensive rebound. And on the other side, the Mercury had the 10th slowest rate, again, in seconds per possession after defensive rebound. We saw already how the Chicago Sky were able to manipulate a slower team in the previous round against the Connecticut Sun. And outside of a game three where the Sky just lacked a little bit of energy, the Sky were clearly the better team throughout that entire series. And when you look at the Mercury, who have a depleted roster, and they lost Kia Nurse to a torn ACL. They were without Sophie Cunningham in game one. This team is really looking for answers on its second unit, and I don't see that changing heading into the rest of the series. C certainly looks like the sky has all the momentum at this point. You know, the WNBA in general, according to ESPN, viewership is up almost 50% this year over last year. What do you think accounts for, for the, the rise in uh, interest? I don't necessarily know if it's a rise in interest necessarily. I do think we have new fans coming into this league and seeing how amazing of a product it is, but there have been so many people interested in this league for so long, but they couldn't access watching any of these games because they were relegated to a channel like ESPN3 or a channel that just wasn't accessible to them outside of if they, they needed a subscription to get access to it. So I think the WNBA has done such a great job in partnering with people like Amazon Prime and giving fans access to these games um, and having games just on ESPN and ABC. When you put women's sports in front of people, they're going to not just view it as women's sports. They're just going to view it as a sporting event that they love. Basketball is basketball. And I think we've seen that um, this season, especially Kathy Engelbert, the WNBA's commissioner said, this was the most watched season since 2008. And it's because of the innovation that her and her team have been able to pull off so far. Right. That game, one of the series was on national television, uh, ABC. And what about Chicago's fan support for this guy? You know, it was, it was maybe tough to draw fans because they were out at Allstate Arena for a long time. And now they're uh, in that Wind Trust Arena next to McCormick Place. Uh, are they growing their fan base? I think they definitely are. And if you saw the clinching game in the semifinals, when Trust Arena was packed, Skytown really showed up when they really needed to. And obviously that it's going to be hard competing against the Bears on a Sunday, like we saw in game three. But again, even then, the this, this Sky really had all their fans come out. They filled the lower bowl. And um, yeah, I mean, again, it's it's tricky, obviously. you The game is still growing. It's only in its 25th year. And if you look at where the NBA was back in 1980, it was also dealing with a ratings issue. But again, they 
hired someone in David Stern to lead the charge and be a, did they hired a creative business person to fix the league and that's what we've seen Kathy Engelbert so yeah the sky they're filling up the they're filling up Wintrust Arena and the game four uh game three is already sold out and game four is almost sold out already so wow. well that's great news for the franchise you mentioned the NBA in the early yeah. 1980s Chicago Stadium was pretty barren those days before Michael Jordan arrived so <laughs> so yeah WNBA still relatively young league all right James K thanks so much for joining us absolutely thank you so much for having me you bet. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols. The Jim and Kay Maybe family. The Polk Brothers Foundation. And the support of these donors. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, WTTW.com slash news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Efforts to track Chicago area COVID hotspots by testing wastewater. <laughs> And a first look at the Joffrey Ballet's official return to the stage. And now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that's proud to serve its community through pro bono legal services. That's a school of hard knocks on finding your roots.